from my side, a warm welcome to all of you on this sunny afternoon here in this powerful installation of Mark Harrington in this amazing space sitting in the midst of these monumental and small works from the recent years. Mark, congratulations to the show. Thank you. I'm Petra Gilo Hirt, I'm a curator, and I know Mark's work for almost 20 years. I know, yeah, I could observe the development over a long period of time, and I had the pleasure and the honor uh, to curate his first museum show in Germany, which has been in the Diocese Museum in Freising, as many other exhibition projects. And I am delighted to be invited to have a conversation with Mark today. Thank you, Andreas. For the invitation. I will not provide you with an introduction to his, of his work, his biography, and offer an insight in the critical reception of his work. I think we are here to listen to Mark, and it's always a gift, a privilege, to share some thoughts with the artist himself. Mark, I have prepared some questions to stimulate our conversations about your work, about your life, and about the meaning of painting and perhaps very general of the significance of art in present times. But I think if you are not so familiar with Mark as a person, I just read his biography, then you're all involved and you have the information about our artist. So Mark was born in 1952 in Bakersfield in California. He was raised between Northern California and the West of England, where his family moved in 1966. He completed his Bachelor of Arts in Sculpture with Art History at Sheffield Polytechnic in 1975, and completed on top his Master of Arts in Modern English Literature, focusing on aesthetics and the history of art and art criticism. Between, after his studies, between 79 and 99, Mark has held teaching positions in southern England, in Spain, in Barcelona, in Norway, in Bergen, and he was director of this School of Film and Art on the Lofoten Island, until the moment when our town unit called him and gave him this great stipend of the Villa Valdetta. So since the year 2000, Mark Harrington is in Munich and he has maintained different studios in Bavaria, in the countryside, very beautiful. So Mark, this is a very short um, overview of your life and it seemed nevertheless a quest, a kind of experimenting with many things, a very varied life. Perhaps you would like to tell us something because at the first view I already think to have Art and literature at the same time is quite specific for an artist. Well, yes, um, it was, there was a sort of an interruption to a clear flow in life from the beginning, courtesy of my parents who um, moved to England when I was 14. It wasn't my decision. Uh, at the time I was fixed on living in Hollywood and I felt that my future lay there. But we came to England, and I passed about 20 years living in, in England, and then decided that I would, instead of returning to the United States, that I would um, uh, go in the opposite direction. And that brought me to the uh, continent of Europe. And so my life um, has continued from that point. I could say that I went on to study literature after fine art because I felt that I needed to um, submit myself to a certain kind of discipline in how we talk about what we look at. And so that became uh, the, the correct umbrella for that <clears throat> at the time seemed to be a department of English literature. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you have an enormous influence from uh, the way you grow up from your stepfather. Perhaps you know that uh, Mark's father is the very famous painter Hussel Smith. So I could imagine that to grow up in the love of a painter could be stimulating and has shown you perhaps from the very beginning your path as well as it could be overwhelming and a burden. Yes, I think it's good that you stated in both those ways. It was stimulating. It was... Um, 
it was immensely stimulating and it was quite challenging. Um, I must say that I, because my stepfather was a painter and a very successful one at that time, Personally, I never made any assumptions that my life would develop in a similar way. In fact, quite the reverse. Um, but he became, um, he became a lifelong friend. It was very challenging in the beginning, but then we sort of worked together mm -hmm. on, yeah. But in fact, he was not a role model for you. You have developed your own language, your own pictorial language. And when we look at the paintings around us and explore these paintings, I mean, it's obvious to me that you are refreshing and renewing abstract painting with new techniques, with colors and materials. So obviously all these paintings, aside from the small ones, they have a massive wooden construction behind to hold the canvas. So I think it could be interesting if you could tell us something about materiality and techniques and how you work and build up the surface of these paintings. Yes. Um, I mean, we have the privilege to see them all around and some things are quite obvious, but I think they have a secret, really a secret, and you should not lift up the secret, but you, I would be thankful for more information about um, the technique. Uh, some years ago, when I was teaching at the academy in Bergen, in southwest Norway, uh, we were fortunate that Lawrence Wiener came to uh, visit all the academies of Norway. And when he embarked on his speech in Bergen, the first thing that he said was, art happens when an individual realizes their dissatisfaction in their relationship to materials. I thought this was quite an outspoken statement on the part of um, an artist that we identify as a conceptualist who works entirely with the spoken word produced in concrete form. But I think that it has universal significance and I feel that my entire life as a maker of paintings has centered around uh, explorations into the differing manipulations of materials. Um, in the paintings that we're looking at here, they are what are called acrylic paintings, but they're not made with um, standard acrylic paints. They are, in fact, a combination of separate water-based components, fundamentally uh, different kinds of medium and high-density liquid um, pigments. And in the manipulation of those relationships, over time, I've found ways to create surfaces that are both matte and um, uh, reflective in a very reduced form. Mm -hmm. So I think the paintings would have an entirely different impact if they were uh, glossy and reflective. So I've taken great measures to reduce that. Mm -hmm. yeah. What we could see is that they have all a distinct structure. So they have a repetition of forms when you look at the horizontal lines and they consist of two panels or even when you come closer there are a few paintings they have even four panels which are together as a unity. So what could you tell us about your idea to put together different parts of a painting and combine them and having a dialogue between them? Well, in the mid-90s, I started making diptychs that were consisted of um, panels at that time standing side by side that were um, gesso surfaces with oil paint. And the two panels were highly contrasted to one another. But by the end of the 90s, I started to make paintings that were physically diptychs, but optically not so, mm -hmm. so that... Uh, I mean, for example, here in this, in this black panel, it is actually physically a diptych, but not perceptually mm -hmm. um, a diptych. Mm -hmm. And I've continued in that, um, in that vein over the intervening years. Uh, more recently, I've put diptychs side by side so that I think structurally the painting would be referred to as a 
apolyptic painting, so multi-paneled mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's up to the viewer to discover mm -hmm. how physically complicated they are, mm -hmm. because my attempt is to make them visually less complicated. I mean, what is impressive to come into this beautiful space in this wonderful light and have these really monumental paintings beside the small formats. So my question would be, what does scale mean to you? So this kind of grand scale and monumental pieces, um, what is the idea behind this that you get large and grand? Because I can imagine that this is also a hard physical work to do them. Indeed, yeah, the paintings are in fact physically heavy and they're made in a very robust way because in the process of making the services, a lot of pressure is put into the surface and without a resilient structure behind the surface, the whole thing would fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm very interested in the relationship between painting and architecture. Um, and in that relationship, there are two challenges fundamentally. One is to make a painting that's so big that it overwhelms the wall. And the other is to make a painting that's small enough to control a large wall. So I wish to confront those two challenges. Hence, mm -hmm. uh, many of them are very big. Some are big, but not so big. Mm -hmm. And others are extremely small. Mm -hmm. I just think how they communicate and how the pictorial language is, as we see that they are all horizontal lines, but nevertheless, each of them is very different. So it seems to me that there's a very strict uh, vocabulary, very conceptual vocabulary, but in this there is an enormous range and variety of possibilities to deal with the line, in fact. Yeah, the, the line is for me an event in space. I'm not trying to create um, designed surfaces that are characterized by a certain kind of linear structure. I see the line as an event within pictorial space. So over the years, the lines have been um, um, increased or decreased in number or in their thickness or thinness and also in continuity from one edge to the other or discontinuity. Um, we see examples of both in the paintings that are in this exhibition. Um, some of the smaller paintings have, very, have lots and lots of lines that are composed in a very rhythmic way and the larger paintings, um, I guess, exploit the difference between the color field and the intrusion of those lines. Mm -hmm. So would you say that you are an evolutionary painter who takes time to develop slowly in pace, as I think that you over a period of 24 or 25 years already develop these lines by getting them yeah, more, yeah, a variation and a variation with no end, in fact. Uh, there is no limitation, and each painting is, of course, different. Mm. So how would you say is this... Um, if there's a constant change, and we as observers are really challenged to see these changes, but they exist. Even we have not a retrospective here to prove this, but that's something which has accompanied all your artistic life long. Well, I hope so. I mean, I'm not going to intrude upon the observer's response. Um, I have my feelings about the paintings, and I'm, uh, I think the paintings are incomplete without the response of observers. So uh, what people have to say about them is crucial to their vitality. Um, yeah. So you would as allow also that we have our own reading of the painting. I mean, I'm, I know that your painting is non-representational, that you don't want to describe something. But nevertheless, I would like to know if environment, for instance, landscape horizon has any influence on you. Uh, also, we don't see landscape in it. So is this something that you refer to coded representational systems? Um, to visual signs, are there any references to something really existing in reality? I don't think so. I'm, I'm sorry to have to say. <laughs> I, 
It's not that I'm illustrating something that I've, uh, you know, secretly illustrating something that I've seen somewhere mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's, um, you know, part of my private experience. It's really that the horizontality of linear structures, for me personally, imply possibilities of expansiveness and of great perceptual spatial depth. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a fascination of mine. Mm -hmm. I feel that verticality of linear structures is more exclusive or excluding to the eye and to the spirit. That's, mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I don't really want to debate whether I'm right or wrong about that. That's mm -hmm. just my feeling. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of that, I make the paintings that I make. Mm -hmm. So it would be in our eye as the observer to associate something like landscape or horizon or even like the score of music or like an altar piece when you think of the altars. Uh, so that's um, our subjective interpretation, but this is not something you would intend with your paintings. That's right, I do, but I don't exclude it. I mm -hmm. hope that the paintings are open-ended enough mm -hmm. so that in fact the observer can make any number of, um, of associations. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's part of the dynamic of, of the paintings. But I mean, you give us a kind of association with the title of the exhibition. So this mm -hmm. is not just Davy Davy, some kind of invention. This has a, um, a meaning and this is coming from something. So that means that you um, draw something into the exhibition here which comes from a different part of art, it comes from music. Perhaps you would like to mm. tell us something about the title, which is quite interesting, I think, and intriguing. Well, you know, as a very young, as a child, in fact, there were four dominant influences in my life, which were um, literature, music, painting, and architecture. I didn't discover them all at the same time. Probably music first, and then literature, and then painting, mm and finally architecture. Um, in this case, the title, Degi Degi, is directly derived from a composition by the great trumpeter Don Cherry, who uh, recorded from the late 50s with Ornette Coleman, and whose music was in fact part of my childhood home. Uh, Degi Degi was recorded many years later, and it, uh, I recently discovered that it may refer to the word degi in Icelandic, meaning noon. So degi degi may mean mm -hmm. from day to day or from midday to midday. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Don Cherry understood it as a rhythm. I see. Um, in the song, or the composition really, it's an instrumental composition in which there are some spoken words. Um, is based on his use of a harp guitar from Mali, which was called a Duzanguni. Mm -hmm. um, the recording was in the mid 70s and I've always loved it. So mm -hmm. it made me feel good and I decided mm -hmm. I'd bring it into this exhibition. Mm -hmm. There's another, uh, the big black and white painting over there is also um, uh, co-opting a title from the same album, which is called Brown Rice by Don Cherry. And the title of that painting is Chen Rezig, which I believe refers to um, a state of enlightenment within Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, this painting over here is, um, I, guess, I guess the correct phrase would be to say I'm hijacking another title. In this case, from Miles Davis. This painting is called Gondwana which is a title of one of the um, compositions in the two double albums that Miles released in the mid 70s, just before he um, uh, uh, withdrew from recording for five or six years. Yeah. But then obviously the title you have chosen adds something to the painting. And it's not that you just have been a friend with Don Cherry as a child. No. I mean, it's that, uh, I ask you, um, because I know about your affinity to music, that Don Cherry stands for this kind of fusion between different cultures. So he draws from Indian, Middle Eastern, and African sources for his music. Mm -hmm. And I thought that could have been something which is interesting for you. Well, d definitely so. And I think, 
I would draw that in by a sort of intuitive association. Mm -hmm. But I think that actually the titles are arbitrary. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But they do have, I mean, they are positive choices. Mm -hmm. So that they do have chosen associative elements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I see them more as spiritual things. I don't think, I'm not saying spiritual in a religious sense, mm -hmm. but um, a sort of dynamic mm -hmm. that they bring into uh, the relationships that I hope the paintings inspire to, mm -hmm. to the observer. Mm -hmm. uh, the painting over there, the orange and sort of yellow painting, is called Chaco. Um, Chaco is... Uh, in this case, a landscape event. It's a canyon in the southwest of the United States um, where I think three to 4,000 year old Pueblo structures exist. It's some of the oldest mm -hmm. known stone constructions um, in the territorial mm -hmm. United States. And mm -hmm. that was something I felt good about and I wanted to bring it in to, in a way, the temperature of that mm -hmm. painting. The, the other painting next to it is called Talak, which is a Norwegian word um, used as, as a name. Mm -hmm. It's a male name, mm -hmm. but it sounded good. And over here, the painting in the center of that space, looking into the sort of hallway, is called Tset, which is a word that I made up. S Z or S Z E T T, which means precisely nothing. But it, I looked it up under Google and I confirmed that there's no other word like it. So it's a unique word that means nothing. And therefore I felt that it was justifiable to apply it to that painting. <laughs> I think the title and the affinity to music are like that I think uh, that this is another dimension of the painting, perhaps not only as a title in the sense of a content, but in the sense of a rhythm of the painting itself mm -hmm. and its pictorial language. I like this. Mm -hmm. But when we come to contemporary painters or influences or role models, perhaps in American art history, I don't know. I mean, it's always very difficult to um, to get a label for something and we don't want a label and we don't want to put somebody in a box. Nevertheless, the question is when we talk about uh, Californian, for instance, and we did a group show West Coast painting. So do you have role models there? So is it abstraction? Is it minimalism? Would you find something or would you see your work alone freestanding? Oh, no, no. I mean, no one invents the idea of being something. Absolutely not. I mean, even Don Cherry didn't invent music or the trumpet. And I certainly have invented nothing. Mm -hmm. But I have um, rendered my own interpretation of a tradition that somehow captured my imagination and, and my soul from a very early age. And indeed, I was influenced by, um, in the early years, by a number of um, American abstract expressionist painters. I guess I couldn't escape it growing up in the household of Hassel mm -hmm. Smith. But it wasn't his painting at the time yeah. that yeah. that um, that captured my imagination. In fact, it was the work of Clifford Still. And of course, Clifford Still is all about verticality. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, he's mm -hmm. a very big influence. And then in much later years, here in Europe, it's been Gerhard Richter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, always difficult perhaps to talk about the, the artist's intention or the artistic intention. As the artist says, I have the paintings, look at the paintings and there you will find it. Um, I would like, coming to the end of our conversation, to quote one sentence by Mark. I think this is a very dense quotation um, about your understanding of your painting. And I would like to ask you something uh, about this, if I may, I will read it to you. This could be an unpleasant experience. Mm. No, no, no. <laughs> I think I have chosen one important thing. <laughs> um, my paintings address the vortex of pictorial space, emphasizing format, surface, transparency, and rhythmic horizontal line. I work with diptychs to resolve separation as singularity. 
I wish for my paintings, whether large or reductive in scale, to confront the viewer within the vertical plane while provoking a sense of liberation into an unbordered expanse. And uh, I like the idea that we not only talk about aesthetics, about form, material, techniques, that we also talk about the liberation into an unbordered expanse, what that means. I mean, are we still talking about painting or are we talking about consciousness or um, life experience? Well, I don't want to appear to be claiming over much for my own work. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I did have a life-changing experience in painting that would provoke um, a statement such as the one that I've made. It was when I was about 19 or 20 years old and I was in London, um, sort of early part of the 1970s. And I went into the National Gallery, which was in those days a very austere place my dear friend John Groom will remember it very well. And I encountered um, um, an exhibition of self-portraits by Rembrandt, which of course are fantastic, but they're very shadowy. And I had a severe migraine headache at the time. And looking at the, the work of, of Rembrandt made the, the headache worse. So, worse. Worse. So I was trying to escape the space and, um, and flee the building, actually, when by accident I happened into a vast space with um, some of Monet's studies for the great water lily paintings. These are in, in themselves enormous uh, fields of color and gesture. And sitting there, they arrested my attention, and sitting there for the next two or three hours, I was actually cured of the migraine headache, which has never returned. I learned something about looking at painting. You know, I learned that it's a thing that can consume a lot of time. And it's a thing that can be transformative. You just need to happen upon the right relationship between yourself and a given painting. The iconography of the painting doesn't matter at all. It can be a Rembrandt self-portrait, or it can be these great paintings by Monet or whomever. Mm -hmm. But for me, I think it crystallized in my mind that um, the germ of an idea that painting could be about an unbordered expansiveness. And ever since then, that's what I've been attempting to, mm -hmm. to articulate in painting. So it does, not, it does not depend on the idea of the abstract sublime. It could be painting itself when we talk about this kind of spiritual uh, dimension. I mean, the freedom of thought or this open up a space to breathe, uh, this is something you would see as um, the intention of, of art in general, to see the, the, the contribution to art that this has also um, a kind of ethic influence on our reality that we are not in an aseptic space just of art. Yeah, I, you know, the more that we advance into this difficult and beleaguered 21st century, the more we advance into a world in which our experience is replaced by a digital experience, the more I think that other things become important and things that we shouldn't lose. And I think that painting is one of those. Um, in painting, we have representational painting and we have presentational painting. My work, I think, is presentational in the sense that it does not represent anything other, or anything from outside of itself. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, it is a, uh, it's a phenomenology of its own. Mm -hmm. It is what it is and you take it or leave it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that has an importance in, in our lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'll go on doing it as long as I can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all my best wishes. Thank you. The development thank of you, your Petra. painting. I think this is a wonderful sentence to end. I thank you, Mark, and um, I thank you for your attention. Um, very pleasant, thank you. Thank you all very much for being here, thank you.